The major question we'll be answering today is will computers replace the weatherman? Let's get started. Hello and welcome back to Master Meteorology, the educational weather series covering the key concepts I learned while earning my master's in meteorology. The major question we'll be answering today is will computers replace the weatherman? Now a good place to start when discussing this topic is actually looking at my last video, how do meteorologists create a weather forecast? If you remember from that video, I said they just check an app on their phone. Just kidding. While this might work for the average person who just wants to know if they should wear a jacket or not, this doesn't cut it for an actual forecaster. The reason for that is because these apps get their forecasts from the major models. And as we'll discuss in this video, those major models do have some flaws. Now, the actual tactic that meteorologists use to create a forecast is called the forecast funnel. You'll remember from my last video, they basically spend the majority of their time looking at the local scale and lower troposphere. They maybe spend five to 10 minutes looking at all the different weather maps for the upper troposphere and a large scale, maybe even continental scale. Then they spend medium amount of, amount of time looking at that middle scale, kind of maybe a few states around them. And then they spend majority of their time, maybe even hours, looking at that lower troposphere local scale. And the reason for that, I kind of teased you in the last video, the reason they spend the majority of their time looking at the local scale is because this is where the major flaw in the models happens. Now, a good place to understand that flaw is to first understand the models in the first place. Now, the major models we look at are the Euro, or the European model, the GFS, or the NAM. The NAM is the North American model, and the GFS is kind of the American model. And how these basically work is, imagine a ton of cubes just surrounding the entire Earth. These cubes are 13 kilometers by 13 kilometers. And basically what we do is put a ton of data into these cubes. Data comes from all kinds of things like radar, aircraft data, surface observations, pretty much anything you can think of that measures weather variables. We put all that data into these cubes and then we use that data inside that individual cube. We put it into a bunch of meteorological equations, aka lots of physics, and then we spit out a short-term forecast. Then they use that short-term forecast, put it back into all those equations, then make the next forecast. The GFS, for example, does this hourly for the first five days, and then it goes up to just twice a day, up to 16 days in the future. The reason that they don't run the model as many times is they figure the forecast isn't gonna be that accurate anyway, so better to save the computing power. Now the air in this model comes from the spatial resolution, aka the size of the cube. If you remember, I said it was 13 kilometers by 13 kilometers. To put that into context, that's a little bigger than San Francisco. And if you think about San Francisco, if you've ever been there, you know that one forecast for the entire city would not cut it. At any given day, the temperature at the coast could be 10 to 15 degrees colder than the temperature inland or in southern San Francisco. And this is where the local forecaster comes in. I actually interned a few years back at KTVU, and it's a station in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I got to see how the meteorologists there use the forecast funnel to actually create a forecast. They do exactly what I've described. They look at all the weather maps for the large scale, then they narrow their focus to just the San Francisco Bay Area thinking about how all that information is going to interact with all their local knowledge that they've accumulated for decades. So they basically take all that knowledge and here's where the key, kind of the key benefit of a human forecaster comes in. They can look at all those different models, combine it with their local accumulated knowledge and then create us create a specific forecast for their local area. They can do this because they know how the model has worked in the past for their area. For example, 
They might know that if a storm is coming in from the northwest, the model tends to have a cold bias or something like that. So they would say, you know, there's a storm coming in from the northwest. There's also this high sitting to the southeast. I've seen that before. And whenever that happens, the models are always a few degrees colder than what we actually end up seeing. So for that reason, I'm going to bump up my forecast by a few degrees. Now that's just one example, but you can imagine where this could be of more importance. For example, how winds behave in a canyon during a fire or how storm surge behaves in a certain cove. The key benefit to a human forecaster, like I said, is they can look at all those models. They know how those models have worked in the past with their specific area. They combine it with accumulated local knowledge and then they can communicate their specific forecast to the public. And that's a skill that I don't think is going to be replaced anytime soon. Now, I know I'm probably pretty biased on this issue, so if you disagree with me, make sure to say so in the comments. I want to hear what you have to say. As always, if you learned anything in this video, remember to subscribe so that you can learn more in the future. Thanks for watching.